Right, uh, Eric John Law, service number 1202100. I was born here at Cherbourg, uh, did all my schooling here at Cherbourg, and actually went straight into the army after I left high school. Well, back in the Vietnam War days, we had a conscription act here in Australia and Aboriginal men were excluded from that conscription act. And it was simply because we weren't citizens of Australia in 1965 when the Vietnam War started. So my dad, who was a World War I veteran, I made a bet with him, which when I look back on it was, wasn't the smartest move, but I made a bet with him that if my birthday came up in the conscription campaign, then that's an omen that I'd, I, I, would, be, uh, I would join up. So uh, of course my birthday came up and then I just joined the army. But I, you know, when I reflect back on it, it was good that I followed in my father's and all my uncle's footsteps, so that, that was a good thing. It was amazing when I first started, when I joined the army. Uh, I went through 1967 and went through all my core training and whatever. Then all of a sudden they, they post me to an Air Force base. And here I am, you know, a young 17 year old uh, black kid from Sherberg. And you know, thinking, am I in the army or am I in the Air Force? But what actually happened was when I got my first posting, we set up the first army aviation uh, unit in Australia and we had to do that at the Amley Air Force Base here in Ipswich. So I ended up doing that. Uh, my training was more into, uh, especially uh, at the aviation unit, was more about the administration, looking after uh, people's uh, complaints and working with our admin officer to make sure everything is run smoothly as a unit. But before I went to Vietnam, my training was more in the intelligence area because I ended up being part of what we call G branch of the headquarters and our job was then was to conduct all the intelligence briefing, all the map reading and all that forecasting of enemy uh, positions and stuff like that so yeah. It was interesting because I was definitely only 19 uh, as the song goes and uh, came into my unit, I went straight from the, my Army Aviation Unit to this headquarters, uh, One Australian Logis Logistics Support Group in Vang Tau. Uh, but my original appointment was to the 161 Independent Recce Flight. Uh, but on the way over they changed that like they normally do. And, and that's where I ended up, but no, it was good. But I was told, uh, I left here in October 1970, and I came back in September 71. You know, Vietnam was a was a different sort of war. Uh, like we didn't have uh, what they call uh, the front, uh, because it sort of moved all the time, and uh, with all the sort of terrorist activities that were going on, like with you know. Uh, young kids walking past a bar with a, a lot of servicemen in and they throw a grenade in or something like that. Uh, those sort of things were happening all over the place. So you sort of didn't have a chance to think, well, I'm not really at the pointy end of all this, but uh, pointy end caught up with you somewhere along the line. Well, I went on my first overseas flight. Uh, it was a Qantas flight back in those days. Uh, and I come home on the HMSA Sydney. I was part of a, a, the, the headquarters uh, and my role every day was to make sure that we checked on if there was any incidents overnight. So back in those days they had the old uh, machine where all the messages came, you know, in, in some big roller, I don't know what they call it, but uh, we, we had to check that first to see if there was any any particular incidents uh, and then we had a daily briefing that we had to prepare for uh, the, the headquarters staff and then from that time on after that was finished it was mainly about uh, collecting data, collecting information, 
and checking out to see whether or not uh, there was going to be any threat to us. We used to, uh, especially for intelligence sort of gathering, uh, we used to go out on what they call perimeter patrols and uh, that took us uh, out of our little comfort zone, so to speak, and uh, we had to go around and just to just... Because how the Vietnam War was affecting us was that uh, we would plant mines where we thought the enemy was going to come, like Claymore mines, and the young children, the young Vietnamese children would see us planting these mines, and then the Viet Cong would come along and have a yarn to their family and threaten their families, and they, unless they told them where our minds were, and they'd go and shift it. So we, we played this game of, you know, shifting things so that uh, our fellows didn't sort of step on it by mistake. Uh, but that was a, a yeah, intriguing part of my role. We did a, a get R&R &R for a week, and I spent mine in uh, Thailand. Uh, because if I would have came home, I'd have spent three days getting home and then turn around and go straight back. So at the end of the day, it wasn't worth it. But you know, when I sit back and I reflect on it, I think, well, how is this, you know, a little black fellow from Sherberg uh, going over here to, you know, the other side of the world. Uh, and that was my first trip in, in a big plane. Uh, that was my first trip in a plane. And, uh, and then I said, well, I might as well see the rest of the world while I'm here. And, uh, and so that's what I did. I took my time and uh, yeah, went to Thailand for a week. During the war time, I, uh, I sort of didn't have a problem with, with the culture over there. Um, I think because of, uh, the Vietnamese were intrigued by us, uh, they, us and the Maoris, they, they sort of uh, took a bit of a shine to in the way of talking about culture and stuff. Uh, they didn't like the Americans, uh, African Americans, uh, but uh, no, it was it, it was interesting. I I uh, took a bit of time. As part of our briefing, we had what we called our liaison unit, which was our army unit that sort of liaised with the local community. So we use that information a lot too for uh, you know gathering of. Uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, so, uh, you yeah, know, I got to go out and talk to a bit of uh, the community, uh, try and get their confidence and uh, yeah, see how we can uh, use that in our forward planning. Now, well, my boss in Vietnam was actually a Kiwi major, so it was a real Anzac type arrangement. Uh, the Americans, sadly, I had nothing to do with them and I was glad that I didn't because uh, I just thought that they were too cocky for me. I, uh, I remember driving down the, the Highway 1, we called it, I don't know why we called it Highway 1, but I was coming back from Nui Dat and this uh, American convoy was heading up north uh, uh, to the Phok Toi province and these guys were just firing live ammunition across the road, you know, as we were driving. And I said, no, you need to stop, turn around. I got out of the car and uh, I gave them a piece of my mind, which was, and they were all, you know, high as kites and they just didn't care, right? But, you know, their mentality was, look, if, if, if uh, you know, we uh, get a tank blown up, we'll replace it, or if we get, you know, lose 10,000 men, we're we'll gonna replace them, and uh, yeah, it was difficult. Well, one of the stories, especially about Claude and myself, um, we were in Vietnam at the same time. Now, I didn't know about that until uh, I got word from my family here in Sherbet. And uh, that was another crazy part of it too, because uh, in the days it was only mail or a video recording that went on those old reels, you know, where you, you recorded your message and that. And they told me that Claude was there, so we managed to hook up, actually it was uh, Christmas Eve, 1970. And we were in this little bar having a drink, and then we sat down there, you know, where thousands of miles away from home here and yet all we could talk about was home 
and you know, like the, uh, we had, we were lucky that we were given a bit of a break by the by the Viet Cong for our Christmas celebrations, but it it sort of just didn't worry us that we were there amongst all this stuff, and we were just wondering what what the mob back here were doing because Christmas back in the days here was a, was a big thing, an absolutely big thing, and uh, it was a big thing for families, and uh, it brought this community together. Uh, in a spiritual way and also in a, a cultural way, and uh, it, it did meant a lot to us. It, it, him and I have a, a strange relationship. We, we both class ourselves as brothers, and yet I only meet him once a year. And and I and, and I don't, you know, I don't have his phone number. I don't talk to him. He doesn't talk to me. But yet, when we meet up, it's it's like I've spoken to him yesterday or something. You know, and I think sometimes, goodness, but. We, we, we came through all of our life together. We, we were uh, neighbours, basically. There's only one house in between my house and Claude's house. Uh, we came up through the scout movement. Uh, we played football together as young boys. Uh, and then we went off into the, to the army together and uh, ended up in Vietnam together. Well, where we were based, we had Nui Dat up in the, the, the northern part, which was up uh, in the Phuc Thuy province. And uh, that's where Pete and those fellows were most of the time. I was in Vung Tau, which was in the sort of middle, and then Saigon was down the bottom. Uh, I ran across a few of uh, my mob up in Nui Dat. Uh, but I, I sort of just never... As I met with them, it was just sort of in passing, like they were either, I was getting on a chopper or they were jumping off or, or whatever. So really, no, the only connection I had was, uh, was probably with Claude. Yes, I, I, I disliked the uh, napalm bombs that uh, the, the Yanks used. I, uh, I never thought about it then, but I thought about it when I came home, I said, you know, uh, that was just a terrible way to die. Uh, I remember my first, one of the things I had to do as an intelligence person on the headquarters was that if there was any sort of civilian death, uh, we had to sort of go down and check whether or not our fellas had done the right thing by, you know, code, code of war conduct or things like that. And I rec the first thing that I, I was only in the country for about, month or so and I had to go down to the hospital and even while I saw this, uh, the result of that napalm bombing and uh, from that time on I just did not like that. I, I just thought that was a cruel way to uh, make a point. But the one thing I, I actually did like about the place was, was, was this friendship that, that I made. You know, like, uh, I've got friends there who are still my friends for life. But again, I don't see them or I don't talk to them much. And yet, you know, that's the crazy, I still, if I try to figure it out, I'll just go worse. But uh, like there's a mate of mine, he's in Sydney. Uh, he only got in touch with me, well, we've been, I've been home, what, 50 years now from the war. Uh, he only got in touch with me about three or four years ago. And, you know, uh, it's like, again, we, we've been talking all of this time, but it's, it's that friendship. And it's about, uh, like the crazy thing, we, we, where I was in Vang Tau, we, were, we would play a, a rugby union game every Wednesday. But the only oval they had was at the uh, police academy uh, in Vietnam. And what happened was, every five o'clock, they would lower the flags. And if, you were, if we were playing the game of rugby, we'd have to stop. You know, you could be just about to score a try or, or get the ball, and then you had to stop. And then you stood there to attention while the flag went down. And when it, when it went down, well, we'll go back, we'll have a scrum to start. It just, but it's crazy. Uh, we only did that, you know, whenever time we could get a team to play against. But uh, yeah, no. you have to improvise. Well, whenever I conduct a tour here at the Boys from Baramba exhibition, I always say that these fellows like Arthur, from the day that they were born, they were surrounded by war. Because when they were babies, the frontier wars had started here in Australia. And then they went to the big war, fought 1914 to 1918. 
Now, when they came back, they came back to another war. And it was only that war because of the colour of their skin. And uh, there's a wonderful uh, letter here that one of our soldiers wrote on his description of what happened to him when he came back. But when I came back, the one image that has stuck in my mind was uh, the only way that I could get up here from Brisbane was to be on a bus. And it was on a Friday night and it left Brisbane at about six o'clock. And I got up here about uh, 11 o'clock at night. Now, you've got to understand that this community was, was under what we call the Protection Act. Now, when I was coming back from Vietnam, no one told my parents. So I knocked on the door, my mother opened the door and she thought I was a ghost. So she fainted, which she normally does anyway. But, uh, and then my dad came out and the next day, the Saturday, my dad and I went to the local RSL here in Mergen. Now I was still only 20 years of age, so I was still a year underage for, for having a drink. But my dad said, no, you're young enough to go to war, you're young enough to come in and have a drink with me. Now, when we walked into that RSL, uh, my so-called, my dad's so-called friends really had a go at him. They basically was saying, you know, why are you bringing this loser into you know, this uh, establishment which is you know, for real returned servicemen? And that was the first time and the last time I see my father cry. And he just said, let's get out of here. I vowed from that day, and it was uh, in September 1971, that I would never join an RSL in my lifetime. I am now currently the only Aboriginal Vice President of a local RSL in Queensland. And uh, yeah, it's strange how those things happen. But uh, uh, at that time, it, it, it was tough for us Vietnam veterans. Um, and we had to put up with it a lot of rubbish. I never went to that welcome home parade in Sydney uh, because to me, you know, the, they didn't welcome me home when I first came home, so I wasn't going to go back for another go. But yeah, it's just, it's those little things. And it's, uh, I thought even then back in the days after uh, 71 that uh, maybe over time I'd, I'd mellow and I, I have and um, just went back and saw what we're doing for veterans and we're doing a lot better now for veterans than we did in the past. The one good thing I, I, I learned about in the military was, was the discipline. Uh, I went on to become a teacher uh, and I was a teacher from, I started first teaching in 1972. So I've been a while. Uh, people always ask me, I don't say I'm a retired teacher because Teachers, we don't retire, we just have very long lunch breaks, you know, 20, 30 years. But uh, at the end of the day, that was one thing that I was grateful for the Defence Force for, was, was that discipline. Uh, I still get up at 5 o'clock every morning, whether it's Saturday, Sunday, uh, and that's, that's just part of my, my, my way that I was, was brought up in the Army. Uh, but certainly the mental part of it, uh, I didn't know when I was a teacher, but I did not know that there was sort of, uh, you know, like a special pension for returned servicemen. I know my dad had gotten a pension, uh, but then when he passed away, legacy was very good to my mum and us. So that was my sort of, you know, understanding of it all. But I didn't understand the real practical part of it. And it was only about oh, 20 odd years ago when I started to not be right in the mind uh, when our local RSL here said, well, maybe we should get you tested and uh, see if you're eligible for any of these things. And at the end of the day, I was, but uh, it's the mental aspects of, of that war and it's that napalm stuff that really gets to me. And that's why I have the greatest admiration for Claude. It's one of Claude's job in Vietnam was to, was to get that napalm stuff ready with the Americans and it really affected him. It, it got into his lungs and I was just amazed that he was, he was able to survive. Uh, but 
It's those sort of images um, that come back. I went to my psychiatrist, oh geez, this would be about 15 years ago. And he said to me, he said, Eric, he said, you will suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. He said, when? I don't know. Uh, how bad it's going to be? I don't know. But I know for one thing, you will suffer from it. And I'm now suffering from it today. Uh, and it's, it frustrates me because I, I, if I'm going to fight an enemy, I'd like to see the enemy so I can give him a whack or whatever. But, but this thing I can't see. And, you know, like, and sometimes, uh, and that's what worries me as a tour guide here, you know, I'm, I'm thinking sometimes just the day that, you know, I'm going to lose it all or whatever. And, uh, uh, but thank God I haven't, uh, it hasn't happened to me yet. But uh, I can understand how we went through it in Vietnam, but uh, these fellows that come out from Afghanistan, I, I think they've got a, a, a different situation, a, a more volatile situation. And I somehow hope that we treat them a little bit differently. We, you know, we just can't say uh, one size fits all. You know, like uh, when I do a tour here for these fellows, like Arthur and them, I always say to people, you know, the, the person who left for World War I wasn't the person who came out. And I think that's a, a story for most wars. But I think Afghanistan is probably and we got a young follower here, a young Aboriginal man here who, who went to Afghanistan. Uh, he's, a, he's a real uh, gem of a bloke. He's a real decent young man. But I could see it in his eyes. There's times when he's starting to second guess himself or do whatever, but uh, he's a most decent man. He's, he's working with me. Uh, in 2019, we had uh, seven suicides on this community of young men. So we decided to set up a, what we call a young men's yarning circle. Now the good thing about the circle, and the circle is an important part of our culture, the circle, in the circle everybody is equal. There is no boss or there is no, nobody more important than anybody else. And whatever we say in that circle stays in that circle. And our yarning circles work like this, is that as an Aboriginal man uh, you come to that yarning circle and whatever baggage you carry, you leave there at the circle. And that's why the circle sometimes always got to have a fire. So at the fire, you figuratively take that baggage of yours and throw it in there and walk away uh, until the next yarning circle where you come back and you go through that again. But we must be doing all right because we haven't had a, a, a suicide since then. So. And this young man has, has been up front with it all the time and leading it, so I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of him. And that's the other interesting thing about all of this, is that Mergen's four miles away, uh, but in reality it is like 4,000 miles away. There's, uh, there's some interesting history between these two towns. Uh, well, the amazing thing uh, uh, about this community is one, uh, I would say, and I'm being very conservative here, but I would say that 80% of this community don't know about these boys from Baramba, which is a bit weird and a bit strange. But you also, in taking that, 60% uh, of this community is under the age of 19. So this is a very young community, as opposed to when I was growing up. When I was growing up, we had a lot of wonderful old people, and they came from all parts of Queensland, uh, but they made this place uh, the, the best place to grow up in. But I think our community, our war memorial here, uh, has been now up for about 30 years, and there's never been any damage done to that place. And we always say that when we're there, this is a sacred, this is a sacred place. And in fact, our Anzac Day is a little bit different to the local one in Mergen. We have a, a smoking uh, ceremony. Uh, we have a, a special dance, which is only a warrior's dance. 
uh, and we combined all of our culture with, with, with the military. And uh, now I, I think the young people here in particular uh, understand about war uh, and they understand about our men's involvement in war. But what they don't quite understand about what it would take, like for the likes of Arthur, can you imagine him going to war and my dad going to war, uh, you know, a lot further away than I went. Uh, and it's understanding that. And we go through like at our RSLs, we say the less we forget. I think sometimes this country tend to forget about what was the sacrifice to those people those men and women and and we should never ever forget and particularly our indigenous veterans we you know like people always ask well why 1903 defense act said you couldn't enlist aboriginal men in world war one and now do we have 45 gold from here so it just puts a different twist to it all i just think it's 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 vital it's it's necessary and it, it, it has to happen, and it has to continue to happen. Uh, I'm glad that I've got three grandsons in the Defence Force at the moment, uh, two in the Navy, one in the Army. Uh, I'm just finished talking to my one of my Navy grandsons and he's enjoying life. My other Army grandson uh, had spent some time over in Malaysia and he's got a taste of that sort of service in another country. But I hope the one thing that they bring back, and this is something that I add and something that my dad had, is that sort of giving back to the community, giving service, you know, like, I always say to our young people here, you know, I go up to the schools just before Anzac Day, and I talk to them about, you know, the boys from Barambo, I talk to them about how their great grandfathers went to war and stuff like that. But I always say to them, you know, like, when you get a chance, you go up and shake a veteran's hand and you say, thank you for your service. And those little words uh, just really mean so much. And uh, I, I can see our communities, like those fellows that went to World War I, um, I can see how easy they fitted into the army in a disciplined way, which was weird because you know, uh, all this discipline was imposed upon them through the Protection Act. But I thought that at the end of the day, that would be a blessing for them in the sense of being able to handle the army discipline. And most of them were able to do that. But it's about this service, this service mentality and about putting others before yourself. Uh, that's the message that I try to get through to our young people. Uh, my connection to country was, was particularly strong. Um, I take that back to the last night before I left for Vietnam. And it was the only time that I sat down with my dad. And I said to him, Dad, why did you go to World War I? Because you didn't have to go. You know, the, de the Defence Act said that you weren't uh, eligible to be enlisted in the Imperial Forces. Why did you go? And he said the darndest thing to me. He said, Eric, he said, I didn't want to see our country stolen again. And that was my mantra, I suppose, that stayed with me in my heart. And it's about that link, that connection to country. Uh, I didn't realize how significant that was. I just thought it was a whole lot of cultural, you know, uh, whatever, but, you know, it sounded good, but. In reality, does it happen? Well, I can tell you that it does because I used to live in Mergen here, four miles away, for about 20 or 30 years. And I thought to myself, well, I'm on country. I'm on Waka Waka country. But coming back here to Sherberg to live, and throughout my life I've either been in Sherberg or other places, but I've always come back home. But here, now when I walk down to this place to do a tour, I actually literally walk in the footsteps of my dad. And that to me is just unbelievable. I, I, I never thought it would have that sort of effect on me. So wherever I went, I've always had this connection to my dad's country. 
But the one part that I, I've missed out on that I'm trying to uh, correct before I leave this world is to think about my mother's country. Because my mother was brought from New South Wales to here uh, back when she was only seven or eight year old. And I need to connect with their, their country because our, our culture is a maternal culture. We go on our mother's side, not necessarily our father's side. So that's the one part of me that's missing in my cultural makeup. I need to find out a lot more about my mum's side. And once I do that, I can call myself an elder. When I first started to access the services of the Department of Veteran Affairs, that would have been about oh, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, it still wasn't as good as what it's getting today. Uh, like I, I've had cancer, I've had a triple bypass, and uh, now I've got post-traumatic stress disorder, and through all of that, uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs in particular have been very, very supportive, not only of me, but of my family. And uh, that's one thing that I'm very grateful for. And when I think about those three things that I've suffered from, well, uh, I've never smoked in my life, and the only drinking I did was when I was in Vietnam. So when I came home, I just uh, uh, didn't bother, but, uh, and yet I've got some brothers who, who don't mind a smoke and a drink every day or every so often and they seem to be healthy as anything. But uh, maybe that's me, I'm trying to live a good life and I'm getting punished for it, but yeah, not to worry. No, but they, they have been good. Uh, that's one thing I will say about America. I was, you know, I was critical of America in the way that they think they can just go in and buy a war and win it like that. But uh, the way that they look after their veterans has improved really out of this world. And uh, I think they regard their veterans uh, a lot better now than they used to. I start here at uh, five o'clock in Mergen uh, with the dawn service. And I come out here and we do an eight o'clock service here and then back into town for the 10 o'clock service. Now, <clears throat> the smoking service, the smoking ceremony here has one role to play. And the role that it plays is that it brings all these fellows like Arthur and them back to us for one day. They come back in the smoke and they join us for one day and at the end of it, they go back. And that's, that's how we use our smoking ceremony in our particular uh, Anzac commemorations here. I would say a couple of things. One is, is, is that service, you know, like, uh, not always expecting the government to, to do everything for you. But also, uh, you know, our number one priority in our culture is always to be respectful. And I would ask, especially our young people, to be a lot more respectful than what they are now. Uh, I know it's not an easy thing to do, but once you've done it and once you've got used to it, it's simple to do. And I think that's the beauty of our culture, that it was simple. How it sort of got stuffed up as it became complicated and people didn't quite know where to go. Uh, that's one thing I would say. The other thing was a bit of advice my dad gave to me uh, uh, before I went to Vietnam. And he said, Eric, he said, you know, there's uh, 880,000 seconds in one day. He said, if you can take 20 of that to be brave, then you're going to be all right. And I say to our men's group here, take just 20 seconds out of the day to be brave. Now be brave might be saying to your brother who comes up and say, do you want to have a drink? And you say no. Or be brave might be when your brother is getting into his womb and you walk up and you say, no, stop it. And if we do that time, and we do it every day, then this whole community is going to be a lot better. But it's about looking after other people. And, and the other thing I, I, I would like to say to our young people in particular is let's not just constantly talk about things, but let's do it. You know, like Martin Luther King says, you know, a man should not be judged on the colour of their skin, but on their actions, on what they do. And that's the message I try to get across to our young people. 
And I get across this other message that if you've got your culture and you've got a very good education and you've got the support of your family, nothing will stop you.